Welcome to the Sunday special on Top Mid Talk. It's a potpourri of our favourite longer pieces, ideal for downloading and enjoying when you have a little bit more time. Top Mid Talk. Hello and welcome to Top Med Talk. I am Desiree Chapel, host of Top Med Talk and the Round Table, and we have a very special treat for you today. We are coming to you from Guy's Hospital in Central London, and I have two consultant geriatricians here. Jugdeep Desi and Jude Partridge, again, consultant geriatricians. And we are going to be talking about the POPs program, something that we, uh, Jugdeep and I, had discussed back in May at the Royal College of Anesthetists. And we wanted to do a little bit deeper dive on what that program is, um, how it works, how you're involved, um, the multidisciplinary team approach that we had talked about before, and where you see the program going and its effect here uh, within this hospital system or in the NHS. So um, I'm going to let you guys introduce yourself a little bit further, and uh, we'll just get right into it. Thanks, Desiree. So the POPs program, that's uh, perioperative medicine for older people undergoing surgery. It's a service that we set up here at Guy's and St. Thomas's back in 2003, and really with the aim of improving outcomes for older people undergoing both emergency and elective surgery. We see patients throughout the whole of the pathway, kind of when they're referred to us normally by the surgical team. They're referred often to us on the basis of the complexity of the surgery, the fact that they may have multimorbidity um, or frailty, other geriatric syndromes, or where there's really difficult, complex decision-making around the best possible intervention for that individual. We see them preoperatively when we assess and we look at all domains, really, the kind of physical domains, the social, the psychological domains. And then we use multidisciplinary interventions really being underpinned by a CGA, Comprehensive Geriatric Assessment Methodology, to ensure that we're optimising patients across that range of pathophysiology. We work very closely with our surgical, anaesthetic and organ-specific specialist colleagues at collating all of the relevant information and then ensuring that we're looking at the, the pathway which is then going to follow. So we're providing information to all of the different teams um, about how we should be managing that perioperative pathway. Um, We also then follow the patients through the surgical journey. So we see the patients back on the surgical wards when they come in and we'll be addressing the medical issues, the rehabilitation and the discharge planning. And we do that across all of the different surgical subspecialties here at Guy's and St. Thomas's. Um, So not just focusing on hip fracture, which is often where geriatricians add value, but now really broadening out to all of the other surgical subspecialties. That's a great introduction. So just to take it back a little bit, and Jude, maybe you can answer this. When was this program started and how? what was really the impetus for it? I mean, we we know that we have an aging population, the baby boomers are coming through. So when was that first um, realized? The POP service at Guy's and St. Thomas's really started back in 2004 because the geriatricians realised that they were often asked to get involved in the care of uh, the post-operative care for surgical patients, but often very late on in the pathway. So perhaps when the patients have been on surgical wards for a number of weeks with numerous medical complications, problems in terms of functional outcomes, and then what they sort of wished they'd been involved earlier on in the pathway. And as you say, of course, we know we have an ageing population and we were very much aware of this as geriatricians. So at Guy's and St. Thomas's, using a Guy's and St. Thomas's charity-funded research project, quality improvement project, the first bit of pilot work looking at whether this methodology that Jugdeep mentions, comprehensive geriatric assessment and optimization, could be used in the surgical setting to try and improve these outcomes that we were seeing late on in the pathway of care. Can you describe the CGA or the, that assessment tool and how that has really helped to guide you know, what you guys are doing with it. So, so comprehensive geriatric assessment and optimization or CGA is a very established methodology used in geriatric medicine, um, which has really got an evidence base predominantly in sort of general medical patients, inpatients, but also in the community setting. And it's sort of really exactly as it sounds. It's the process by which you assess different domains of an older person. So not just the sort of a medical domain, but also social, functional and psychological areas for that patient. 
end. And then with everything that you've identified from that process, you try and put a kind of tailor-made yet evidence-based plan in place so that the patient then is optimised according to all the things that have been identified. And what the evidence base has showed in both the general medical inpatient population and in community patients is that CGA makes it more likely that a patient is going to be um, alive and living in their own home, usually with better cognition, at up to 18 months after that process of assessment and optimization. So what we were doing in the POPs model is trying to translate that to the perioperative setting for patients undergoing surgery. That's actually a really, really cool concept to be able to do that. Um, we talk about population health and improving um, improving the overall general health, and I think that would, would, it's a great tool to be able to do that. So when... We've talked a lot about the different databases that we have, you have here in the NHS, like the National Emergency Laparotomy mm-hmm. Database. So how have you used those types of things within this process? So geriatricians have been involved in national audit in a variety of different settings, um, in the stroke audit, in the national hip fracture, um, national hip fracture database. Um, And really the geriatricians, orthopaedic surgeons and anaesthetists came together to firstly develop guidelines which were endorsed by all of the societies around hip fracture. That then led to the establishment of the National Hip Fracture Database and that in turn also led to the best practice tariff. And it was really pulling those three strands together that has driven the improvements in quality of care for older patients with hip fractures. And so what we've really learned from that process is the fact that we need to translate that out now to other populations. And we've seen how we've learned the lessons from the NHFD and translated those to the National Emergency Laparotomy Audit, where again, we We've been starting to link up guidelines from the Royal College of Surgeons around the higher risk surgical patient, linking that with the National Emergency Laparotomy Audit, helping us to benchmark units against one another, but also allowing us to review our data and then improve, use quality improvement methodology to drive up quality of care, as we're already seeing from the first three sets of the NELA data, which is coming out. This is now being used to work up a best practice tariff for the National Emergency Laparotomy Audit, which again we hope will help us to deliver those improvements in care on a wider national level. So uh, what are some of the outcomes that you have seen since you've been implementing this and making, you know, you have the the data now to show um, what are those outcomes and then what are you seeing when you are talking to the other team members, the, the surgeons and anaesthetists? So I think in the evaluation of any service like this, it would be really nice to show both um, clinician reported outcomes, so those traditional things like morbidity and mortality, but also very much patient related outcomes and things that patients constantly mention to us are things like functional status and what are they able to do after surgery. But also, of course, particularly in the NHS setting, we do need to think about efficiency and process measures, so cost and length of stay. Um, and so we've tried to use a sort of mixture of different methods of evaluating this. Um, But one of the most recent things we've done is to look at this in a randomised control trial in older vascular surgical patients where we randomised patients who are having arterial either aneurysm or lower limb revascularisation procedures to either being referred through the POP service and having this preoperative CGA and optimisation or going through the standard process within the trust at the time which was was a pre-assessment clinic with them referral on to either anaesthetic colleagues, to organ-specific physicians, or back to general practitioners for optimization. And we were powered to show a reduction in length of stay, um, which we did show actually in the, the study that the POPs group were, were in hospital for 40% less time than the control group. But digging into that data, we think very much that's due to fewer medical complications in the group who had CGA and optimization. And of course, there is a cost um, implication to a shorter length of stay. And we're evaluating this in terms of health economic t- um, terms at the moment. So we have talked a lot about the 
the teamwork and you've said you've worked with your colleagues. How is that working? Because I'm sure that they actually really appreciate the extra input. Have you noticed that it's picking up or was it difficult to start? How's that going? So at the start of the, the POP service, it was pretty difficult because, of course, geriatricians haven't traditionally worked with surgeons outside of orthopedics. And also there's a little bit of uncertainty about the role of geriatricians and a lack of understanding of where we can add value. So we've worked really hard at establishing relationships with our surgical colleagues and then with anaesthetics and other organ specialties to demonstrate how we firstly can work together and secondly how we can improve outcomes through this collaborative approach. But this does require building up of trust and kind of understanding of each other's role, not stepping on toes when you shouldn't be stepping on them, but at the same time challenging each other to really drive quality of care up. So it's required a kind of multifaceted approach. One has been on a kind of social social, cultural kind of level where we're starting to learn each other's language, understanding how to communicate with each other, um, even down to, you know, how best to write an email to somebody to get the right answer back from them. Um, So that's been an interesting process, learning cultures within specialties. Um, In terms of establishing trust, I think there is something about us demonstrating how we do add value um, clinically with our very holistic approach, but with a very evidence-based approach. You know, it's about putting together the evidence from the cardiology literature, the cognitive disorders literature, kind of, and putting that together and demonstrating how geriatricians think within those complex kind of settings. There's a little bit around that, demonstrating value. And then there's also been quite a lot around education, which has absolutely been two-way kind of education. It's about us learning about surgical procedures, the impact of those procedures, the anaesthetic management in different settings, and so a lot of education for us but also for our colleagues in those other specialties around the complexities of geriatric medicine. And we've tried to do that through a a number of different approaches in terms of the education and training. So part of which has been very formalised education and training, and then some of which has been very informal um, through those emails, those telephone conversations, interactions on the ward. Do you have any formal educational materials or, you know, rollouts um, for the other providers? We've approached education and training, first of all, about thinking about different grades of doctors. So there's been a a focus on the medical profession. We've developed an education and training program for FY doctors. These are foundation doctors. So these are people who in the first two years after graduating from medical school. So we now have a rotation based within POPs where they come and work with us for four months two months of which is on the ward working directly with our team, one month which is working in the outpatient setting, doing the high-risk clinics with us, going out to the community, going and working in theatres at the surgery end, the anaesthetic end, so that they're really starting to get an understanding of the whole of the perioperative pathway. So there's that level of training for the foundation doctors. We've set up a specialist training program for registrars in geriatric medicine and also open to anaesthetic trainees as well, where they come and work with us for a year and they work through the different surgical subspecialties where we're based, getting kind of specialist knowledge around perioperative medicine in complex older patients. And then in terms of consultant level education and training, we've set up a national meeting, which is very much a focus on education, both in terms of setting up services, but also in terms of organ-specific medicine within the context of multi-morbid older patients having surgery. Supporting that, there's e-learning modules, which we're hosting through the British Geriatric Society and also form part of the UCL perioperative medicine MSc as well. So a variety of different approaches um, for the medical profession. And then using that learning, we're now translating that to the allied health professionals group with our advanced nurse practitioners 
practitioners within the team. We've written a curriculum, a competency framework, and again, supporting that through e-learning um, modules as well. And that should all be ready and up and live for this autumn. So September 2018, when that should be ready for other units to start to come and use some of those resources. Monty Marthen, Editor-in-Chief of Top Med Talk, has joined us and he has a comment. I've got a, a question really. Could you expand on out into the community? In other words, does your team do home assessments? Our interface with the community is constantly changing and evolving. So the things that we're now working on at the moment are around how we start to engage with primary care in a more meaningful way than we have been doing so far. So we're just about to start up a a DARSI fellowship working between primary and secondary care where we're going to be looking at the knowledge and skills that GPs do currently have around pre-operative assessment and then start to work with them at developing educational packages that they can be utilising to upskill them in that initial assessment and also looking at what they could be doing in terms of optimization and whether this is feasible and acceptable to GPs and how we actually implement that into primary care. Um, And then that will then hopefully inform where we take that kind of moving forwards. So there's that piece of work. The other piece of work is around the post-surgical kind of end of the pathway. We've been doing some work around how we make sure that the information flows from secondary care back to primary care in the right format. What information actually is useful for patients, their GPs, other providers out in the community and ensuring that that's really meaningful and should be doing what it you know, should be doing. We also link in with the intermediate care services out in the community, so particularly the rehabilitation centres. So our team directly provides medical and rehab discharge planning support to our local amputee rehab unit. For the other units, we engage with them, but we don't directly provide hands-on care within those settings. But of course, that's the added value of geriatricians within this kind of pathway in that we're often very aware of what services there are out there, how best to access them, how to signpost people to them, and how to get people kind of communicating with each other in the in the most useful way. Are district nursing services still alive and well? I'm looking that you cover the... SE postcodes here which is where I was born and grew up initially yeah. and, and my mum was a district nurse so I know yeah. there used to be a very large community of people who knew the complex patients in the community well and this the rehabilitation care often fell in their laps so yes are they still there and highly organized yeah so district nurses are very much still sort of alive and, and used with a, a variety of different roles many of the traditional things that you'd probably be used to so catheter management administration of intravenous antibiotics stressing changes but very much the kind of management of complex multi-morbid patients in order to support gps is done by a community matron structure now with an mdt meeting in order that geriatricians can feed into that so community geriatricians with GPs and community matrons sort of managing a caseload if you like of complicated patients so whether that's people that attend A&E frequently whether it's frequent fallers whether it's people with difficult to manage dementia is very much managed through an MDT but with with big involvement from community matrons. When we were talking about the POPs program back in May, there was an interest to roll this out through other hospitals and facilities across the country. So how's that been going and and what are the um, opportunities for that, I guess I should add? We've been working on the POPs program for a number of years now and, and generating evidence from a single site. But of course, the question that we're always kind of then presented with is this is great and it works at Guy's and St Thomas's but how can we kind of make sure that we can see these types of services being set up in other hospitals and will they deliver the same results as they've done at Guy's and St Thomas's. So we did a survey back in 2014 which showed that only around about well three units around the country were delivering this type of service. But what was really useful through that survey survey was that we were able to gather information about the reasons why people weren't doing 
these types of kind of models of care or delivering these types of models of care. And what really came back from that was that they told us that they didn't have the workforce to deliver it and that they didn't have the funding to deliver it. So that was a real challenge back to us, a very clear challenge around what we needed to do to support units that did want to deliver POPs-type models. So as you've heard, we've kind of started to address the workforce issue through some of the education and training programs that we've established and also recognise that there aren't enough geriatricians around the country to deliver this type of service and all of the other work that geriatricians are constantly being asked to do. So that's why we focused on also making sure we were setting up and delivering an education and training program for allied health professionals so that we're really exploring the alternative workforce which is out there. In terms of the funding side of things, of course, we don't have a massive pot of money that we can just distribute around the country and kind of say, here you go, you can get on with it. But we were presented with an opportunity around about 18 months ago, two years ago now, when the Vanguard programme had was starting up, the NHS England Vanguard programme. And we bid for £25,000, so a comparatively small pot of money to set POPs up at a district general hospital, Darrant Valley Hospital, which is about 20 miles outside of London. It's a, a hospital which has had its kind of own financial issues. It's got a workforce issue. So it's been, you know, it was a, the best testing ground for something like POPs. And so with that 25000 what we did was allow that to pay for half a day of consultant time, two days of registrar time for a period of a year to scope out, design, embed a POPs type service. And it's been a great success at Darrant Valley. So within that time, with that small pot of money, we were able to do that. We were able to write up a business plan which was presented to their board um, who saw the value of this both in terms of quality of care but also importantly in terms of finance as well. And this has resulted in a a mainstream funded service within 18 months of us kind of making that first phone call. And that service is going really well. It's replicating the same results as we've seen here, the same reductions in late cancellations of surgery, length of stay, readmissions, as well as the quality markers as well. We're also supporting lots of other units around the country and also now increasingly internationally at setting up POPs. And I think what we have to be really careful about is making sure that the new models of care which are set up do show fidelity to the original concept of POPs. Um, and the core components of POPs, but that it's adapted to the local setting, the local population, the local workforce, so that we're not just trying to enforce something within that setting, but it really is fit for purpose for that new setting. So, Jagdeep, do you have any examples? I see the one you cited there, Mm -hmm. but still, let's call it on the mainland. Let's imagine you're trying to serve a community like Jersey or the Outer Hebrides. Do you have any example? And it's a, a wacky question, but is there a sort of pops light version where a one man band can, can one woman band can deliver all of this? So there's no evidence to say that we can do it um, with a one man band in any of those more remote settings. But I think, you know, and and that's the kind of challenge again to us is the next step really around, you know, where do we take this beyond the mainland? And where do we take it where we don't again have geriatricians who are ready and you know, to get going with this as they were at Darrant Valley. You know, we did have enthusiasm there. And that also then begs the next question as to whether it has to be a geriatrician who's delivering it or whether it can be people from different clinical backgrounds who want to gain those skills and develop those skills over time. And, you know, I think that's something else that we're really interested in supporting and then evaluating as to how that can be done. 
there is some literature out there showing that when we try to have CGA delivered by people who aren't trained in geriatric medicine, that then it doesn't show the same level of benefit. But I suppose it's also about us trying to you know, define what is the level of benefit that we want to be seeing. And it may not be the gold standard, but at least it is driving up improvements in care. So I think, you know, again, that's another challenge back to us, Monty, as to how we take that forward. Monty, you have another question. Jagdi, um, if there's been any pushback, so let's imagine there's a group that's slow to learn to love you and why it's important that they should love you. Are there any groups like that? And what, and what what's the pushback? What's the persistent pushback, if any? Over time, there have been different groups who've had different concerns, you know, some of which have been absolutely kind of valid. And, you know, it's about the interface between teams. How is this going to work? Are we going to have too many cooks? Who's actually accountable at the end of the day? So it's often those kinds of concerns that can come from each of the surgical subspecialties. But over time, kind of as we've seen that, you know, we've developed those relationships that started to improve I think one of the kind of issues nationally and internationally at the moment is to you know which specialty is going to be delivering per- this new specialty of perioperative medicine and certainly whenever you're kind of you know at different conferences and things that's often the question back is you know is this something that should be led by anaesthetists or geriatricians or other physicians hospitalists in the states personally I don't think it has to be any one particular group of people who are leading it um, or delivering it. I think it's about developing a set of clinicians with the right skills, knowledge, and particularly skills around kind of communication between teams and and with patients. And I think that's probably a challenge to us kind of, you know, in anaesthesia, in geriatric medicine, in surgery, around how we start to support people who want to become perioperative medicine specialists from whichever background they're coming from. So I think that's probably one of the biggest pushbacks at the moment isn't from any one kind of specialty as such. It's this general kind of question about who is actually going to want to do this and who's got the skills and the knowledge and the right attitudes and the right behaviours to be able to do it. So completely support that idea. You mentioned in passing, last question from me if I may, Desiree, best practice tariffs. Now, I think you said there is one for the fractured neck of femur, which I think has gone well. If you could explain a little bit about what that looks like and And you then mentioned that you're trying to get one of those for the the emergency laparotomy work. I'm not an expert on best practice tariffs, but um, from my understanding of them, it's about picking particular components of care where we know that we've got a good evidence base and saying that, you know, these are the components of care that we feel should be delivered on a consistent basis within a unit to be able to attract some financial benefit for the organisation. And the advantage of having that there is that it allows organisations to reorganise their clinical services, pulling in the right expertise, so paying for geriatrician time, paying for a perioperative medicine lead, paying for the right surgeon, and also, you know, things like making sure that we have emergency theatres available at the right time um, for patients. So it's a it's a mechanism that allows organisations to step back, reorganise and make sure that their system's working. And, you know, it's really hard to unpick with hip fractures what's really driven those improvements in quality of care. Has it been the guidelines? Has it been the database and allowing people to see where they're at? Or has it been the financial reward? But it's probably, you know, like any complex intervention, it's probably all of those things working together to drive quality care. So I think, you know, there's clear lessons for us to learn for the National Emergency Laparotomy Audit from this and developing a BPT within that setting. And at the moment, the NILA group are starting to put together what they think would be the core components that we would be wanting each organisation to be delivering to be able to at- attract the best practice tariff. So why not a best practice tariff for POPs overall? to allow people to set up the services it seems like it's usually those levers that make people believe they can do it at cost neutral that will then turn into increased value that that are the triggers for people to get on with it so that would be great (laughs) you know it'd be lovely to have a best practice tariff for pops and i think that would you know um, allow organizations to move things forward 
Um, I think one of the things that we're constantly kind of asked about is the fact that do we have enough evidence to say that this is the model of care um, that should be being endorsed on that national level? Um, certainly, we think that we have a good body of evidence to be supporting the use of CGA in the perioperative setting, but it's not at that multi-centre, randomised RCT level, which is often what organisations such as NICE um, would want to have to be able to endorse this at that level. But we are working on it, you'll be happy to know. So we are starting to look at the scale-up of POPs kind of nationally and looking at using QI methods working with implementation science specialists at looking at developing that evidence base to then support our approach to NHS England at getting something like a BPT in for POPs. That'd be amazing. Top Bed Talk. All right, we are at Guy's Hospital down in central London, and we have another special guest with us here discussing the POPs program at Guy's, and it is Magna Sabai, and she is a trainee doctor in gerontology. Thank you so much for joining us. So I guess we'll just start off by asking how you got involved with this program and and your interest in gerontology and how you've come into this program here at Guy's. Okay, so throughout my training, there's various um, encounters that I've had had with perioperative medicine, mostly through orthogeriatrics, which is reasonably well established in the UK. Um, there aren't that many, it's a developing um, part of the curriculum for geriatric registrars and that the, the, the higher grid in our curriculum for perioperative medicine has only recently um, been established. And I had the opportunity of doing a six month job in a, another trust um, in a less developed service. And I liked the caseload. So there's lots of geriatric issues as well as acute general internal medicine issues. And the idea of having continuity through a patient's care. So seeing them preoperatively, trying to optimize them for surgery and then following them up and case managing them up until discharge and I wanted to come into a service that was more developed um, because I thought that this is potentially uh, something I'd be interested in as a career so I'd I was lucky enough to work with somebody who'd been a fellow here previously as my boss um, asked a bit more information saw that the job was being advertised read a bit more about the service. It sounded like something that I would get a lot out of um, and would be well suited to the skills that I have and the type of medicine that I'm interested in and applied for the job. And as they say, the rest is history. (laughs) So what has your experience been here so far um, working as um, a trainee? It's been amazing, actually. So there's a real focus on collaborative working here and shared decision making. It's been great as an experience being exposed to so many different surgical specialities so from vascular to general surgery to urology to some of the more complex surgeries that I haven't had experience of before things like max fax and ENT surgery and being able to see CGA working so comprehensive geriatric assessment which is well established and good evidence base in general geriatrics being used in the perioperative setting has been a great experience because it does work and I've seen that firsthand and it does pick up all the issues that you can then target your interventions to and the thing that I've found most interesting is the shared decision making and talking with surgeons and anaesthetists and patients about what is the best option for them based on all the information we've gathered and I've been surprised coming into it some of the patients that we can get through surgery and have good outcomes but also equally surprised about the patients that we have decided for them the best option isn't surgery and how do we optimize symptoms and quality of life for them. One conversation I think that we have on Top Med Talk is about shared decision making and working as a team to do that and then actually having the conversation with the patient and how that can be rather difficult. How is communication with your specialty, so the elderly population, different you know, than what you have dealt with in the past? So I think it's not different at all, actually. I think that what is different in the POP service and I think is different is in geriatric care is that we're not afraid of talking to the patient. So many other specialities will feel that this patient is old, they may not understand the risks and benefits and don't discuss 
it with them frankly. And actually, my experience is, even with patients with some degree of cognitive impairment, if you can take the time, explain it to them in a way that they can absorb the information, and that might mean several times meeting them and going through the issues, that actually they really appreciate it and they can come to a decision that... um, is best for them because at the end of the day they're going to have to live with the implications of surgery or not having surgery and they should be entitled to be involved in that discussion so actually I think there aren't that many issues regarding communication and the issues are related to medical professionals not having that conversation in the first place. So very true. (laughs) It it is a difficult conversation. And if you're not prepared and trained for that, I think that's when it becomes even more difficult. Um, How has it been working with some of your other specialty colleagues, so anesthesia, surgeons, and also nursing um, and bringing them into the conversation other allied health professionals? For me, it's been really interesting and enlightening actually I think if you come at it from the angle that there are parts that you won't understand and there are parts that you will be an expert in and that if you have an open and honest conversation about I don't think that this should happen or I think this should happen what do you think or asking when you don't understand what are the surgical procedures that can be done for this patient or what are the um, anaesthetic options that are possible then actually the discussions aren't difficult it just requires almost a bit of humility and saying I don't understand this would you explain it to me and I think that's what's important in shared decision making there is not one specialty I think that can do perioperative medicine alone I do think we need anaesthetists physicians and surgeons to work together to to come to the best outcome. Thank you so much for sitting down with us. I really do appreciate it. It's an enlightening conversation, of course. So um, we will catch you later. Thanks. Top Bed Talk. Um, Jagdeep is going to introduce two um, very special guests here at uh, Guys. Jagdeep, who do we have here? So we have Jason Cross, who's our advanced nurse practitioner and the nursing lead for the POPs team. And we have Claire Gallagher, who is one of our Band 7 clinical nurse specialists working within the team. So they do lots and lots of our work um, within the team and we couldn't function without them. So Jason's been doing a lot of work around the things that I was mentioning about developing the allied health professionals kind of program with developing a curriculum, a competency framework and e-learning modules to support that. And Claire's been doing lots of work uh, clinically with us, both pre-operatively around the assessment, optimization, delivery of CGA, but really kind of works very closely with the patients on the ward, both in the emergency and the elective patients coming through. So I don't know, Jason, if you want to talk about how we are developing the nursing program within POPs. What a fantastic um, introduction. (laughs) So we are, um, we struck on the idea uh, of developing a nursing program after we'd had a couple of nurses from the ward join the team and started thinking about how we upskill members of nursing staff and thinking whether we could actually expand it to an educational program that anybody could jump in on, learn about perioperative medicine with a nursing focus. So using our experience, using our uh, current nursing team and also scoping some of our ward colleagues as well, we've been putting together a competency framework, working closely with Health Education England to ensure that we're actually doing it correctly and properly and then linking with the BGS utilizing some of our other curricula or junior doctors and more senior SPRs to actually create a curricula that will hopefully support the band six or band five or six nurse to maybe into an advanced nurse practitioner within perioperative care. You're working with not only the nurses that are involved in the geriatric side but across the all the different specialties right and how how has that been to to work as a team Um, as part of the nursing group. It was evident when I was developing or looking at the competency framework early on, not just to think that just because I do something well or or we're doing something well, that we should just be saying that's the way we should do it. So it was really interesting for me to actually be talking to to nurses outside the the geriatric kind of nursing arena, actually talking to junior junior kind of developing nurses across um, surgical specialties to look at ways of clinical supervision um, and integrating that that kind of ward-based ad hoc um, kind of learning and support throughout the whole of the competency framework. Things like clinical supervision... uh, my concern was you become a specialist nurse or you get a title of specialist nurse, but you haven't 
people come into those roles without a lot of specialist knowledge. They obtain a, a title of specialist nurse without really understanding yes. the pathways that they are supporting or the care, care that they are promoting. So it was, it was very important to me that within the competency framework, we actually factored in some of that clinical supervision, the background foundation skills to a lot of the advanced nurse practitioner um, um, the kind of focus um, education early on so they so when they did step up they actually had the foundation of skills that they needed. Fantastic. Well Claire being on kind of the clinical side and working with patients, how have you um, realized this making a difference in your practice and then for patients? Just leading on from what Jason was speaking about just there with clinical supervision for kind of more junior members of the team. I started as a BANSIX uh, patient pathway coordinator in the POPS team and uh, had come straight from as a straight from the wards as a staff nurse um, and have found that my skills have greatly increased and um, my whole understanding of the perioperative pathway and what medical liaison services can add and do add to uh, the geriatric patient on the ward um, is just improve like tenfold. Jason would, is, uh, provides my clinical supervision and I've worked really closely with him um, and have actually moved from working more as a pathway coordinator to working more directly and slightly more independently on the wards as a clinical nurse specialist and completely agree with what he says is that you get given a title of clinical nurse specialist <laughs> with not much um, in, uh, knowledge of that clinical, often of the clinical pathways in that I area. I think it's worth supplementing that and what we we want to do with any kind of educational kind of program or competency framework is highlight it, you just don't need nursing support, you right. don't need nursing, um, nursing guidance and my professional kind of practice and my clinical skill acquisition has been done in partnership with Jug Deep, the other consultants. I have two line managers. I have a nursing line line manager and I have a clinical supervisor in Jug Deep. And that's what we want to support and advocate with not only just with perioperative pathway kind of education, but also for advanced nurse practitioner education across the board. I think it's something that's probably lacking and something as advanced nurse practice becomes more prevalent within, within the health service probably is needed as well. In the US, if you obtain an advanced level nursing degree, advanced practice nursing degree, you can focus in geriatrics or other other specialties. Is that can you do that here? It's, you, it's usually the way. It's usually you've kind of followed your nose into a particular area of nursing that you like, and then you become a clinical nurse specialist, so quite focused. And then the advanced nurse practitioner pathway is a lot broader. It has an emphasis on, on prescribing and comprehensive assessment. So the avenues open slightly. The clinical nurse specialist tends to be quite single organ or specialist, kind of specialist area focus, whereas the advanced nurse practitioner has more flexibility to change career paths. So Claire, you said you were on the wards before. Were you working with the elderly population there and geriatric population there? Is this something that you've just kind of changed since you've been involved with the POPs model? I was based on surgical wards before I came to this team, and most surgical wards have a very high population of elderly patients, especially in the hospital that I was working in and the unit I was working in had quite a high population of multimorbid maybe even slightly younger patients, but definitely multimorbid with the beginnings of geriatric syndrome. So um, I feel that I was quite prepared for the population that we see, but probably didn't realise the potential of POPs, the medical liaison service that they could have added to my care for those patients. I was just wanting to know kind of the difference that you saw and, you know, and when you're taking care of patients then versus taking care of patients now with this model. I have a much more holistic look at the yeah. patients that I'm caring for now. Um, using the CGA, uh, the Comprehensive Geriatric Assessment of the Ward has, even though I do think that it is very similar to the Roper, Logan and Tierney that we were taught in university, it's enabled me to see a lot more rounded view of the patients and the and really focus towards functional trajectories and where they're going to be after uh, they leave hospital, not just focusing on what their blood pressure is on the day of surgery, on the day after surgery, that sort of thing, but more so looking at them in the the future in the community with their families and how we can successfully manage their, their independence or maintain their independence pre and post 
surgery. Just wanted to add to kind of what Claire's kind of saying is Claire's kind of very modest as is most of our team. So I mean I think really just to kind of describe what Claire might do when she goes up on her regular ward rounds is that um, she'll come back to talk to me about the patients and what she will have done already is gone and assessed the patient post-operative for example this is post-operatively so she will have assessed the patient will have examined the patient independently will have reviewed drugs considered stopping starting she's working on her nurse prescribing course now so she'll be an autonomous prescriber hopefully within the next year or so she will have reviewed ECGs chest x-rays and then come back and present that patient in a really concise succinct articulate manner back to me such that often I just need to then add a couple of things to the plan that she already has in place and I think the other real value which is constantly fed back to me when I'm talking to senior nurses from around the hospital is how Claire and the team are changing the way that our the rest of the nursing workforce integrate, talk to each other, the language that they use when they're reviewing older patients and upskilling them as well in the assessment and management of older patients. So I think, you know, the added benefit is not only to that individual patient, but also the added benefits across the workforce in the hospital. Claire, Jason, team anaesthesia, are any drugs that we tend to prescribe that you really wish we didn't? Oh, I know you've probably educated out of everyone here, but take a broader view. What are the what are the biggest enemies? Uh, tramadol. Yes. Uh, <laughs> tramadol's horrible. It's just evil. You know, um, cyclozine. You know, its impact and exacerbates delirium. Um, and Claire's just whispered a, a dance baton as well. Um, they're, they're the, you give every single patient. They, you give every single. You know, they they ju- they just they're just not nice to our older patients. You know, it's um, but you know th- th- there may be very good reasons why you're prescribing certain medication uh, medications and and it's only it's only by us having this collaborative kind of discussion and and um, that that we'll we will learn for each other. We don't know every every indication for every medication that's given through um, an anaesthetic. And there may be a very good reason, no matter what of the side, side effects. So it's the, the list, that's our little bugbear, but maybe there's stuff we prescribe that you don't like either. <laughs> so what are, give us three alternatives then. Oh, some of the simple analgesics are, are under... Under, uh, under prescribed things like paracetamol I know that we, you know, we are very much focused on kidney function and obviously in a patient that's renally impaired then we need to avoid non anti-inflammatories but there are benefits I think I work predominantly with GI patients so looking at some anti-emetics that could also help other you know, gut stimulate, uh, st- stimulation like uh, metroclopamide there's always an alternative and you just need to come and ask us <laughs> Jagdeep, I heard that you've got a frailty unit in your emergency room, your A&E. Yes, yeah, so we've set that up over the last probably 12 to 18 months now, and it's gone through a number of iterations over that time. But we're now based down in A&E. We've got a set of recliner chairs and then a number of trolleys. So it's not a kind of bed-based unit as such. Patients who are frail with specific conditions when they turn up at A&E, so things like an episode of delirium, a urinary tract infection, a fall, or an exacerbation of a long-term condition, move directly into the frailty unit, which is a consultant-led unit, but with therapy, staff, pharmacy support, and a junior doctor who's predominantly there for training. And so patients who are seen there, our aim is to effectively um, support them in terms of their long-term condition and to ensure that they can have a safe and effective discharge directly from A&E home. I think you were just sharing a story with us that one of your colleagues had seen, I think it was nine patients. And how many of them did she manage to get back home? So our shifts down there at a weekend. So this was um, at the weekend just gone. She had run a shift from 11 in the morning till eight in the evening. And in that time had seen nine patients, all of whom were pretty complex, frail, older patients. And eight of those patients were discharged directly home, but with the appropriate services inputted both from social care 
care, rehabilitation, but then having access to what we call hot clinics here, where patients can then be reviewed back in a very timely fashion to make sure that it has been a safe and effective discharge. That sounds fantastic for everyone. That sounds wonderful for the patient, wonderful for the family huge contribution to the challenges of the acute hospital so is everyone going to have one soon or is it slow coming it's actually picking up haste really so frailty units are starting to appear at a a lot of hospitals and certainly we weren't the first to start this there have been a number of units which have been running very effectively around the country already and i think it's about us kind of learning lessons from units which are already established not reinventing the wheel getting the proformers that they already use their policies adapting them to your local context and then getting up and going not waiting to develop the perfect pathway but getting it going and then constantly changing it and reviewing it in a constructively uh, criticizing your own service um, and looking at the data changing it as you go along so they are coming at pace monty there's lots of units starting to appear around the country i think you do need to have geriatricians directly leading those services and again that's another challenge to us in terms of the workforce but a lot of the work is delivered by nursing colleagues allied health professionals so from a relative's perspective it must be wonderful to know that you can take your frail elderly loved one to the hospital to what looks like the A&E environment and know that there's a very real chance they'll be coming home with you again. That, that must be wonderful. It is wonderful and I think most patients and families, carers are, you know, that's exactly what they would like to see happening. But at the same time, I think there is a public perception that patients with frailty and with complex multimorbidity are best served in the hospital as well. So there is something, some work that we need to do around empowering patients, their families, their carers, and starting to help kind of, you know, really facilitate that kind of understanding about where the best place for care is which clearly is sometimes a hospital you know we shouldn't be denying this group of patients acute hospital-based care where appropriate but there is some work to be done around kind of public understanding of the effectiveness of an early discharge home absolutely you know i think we're possibly in a privileged position where we've seen all the different alternatives and if at all possible, home is best. I mean, Desiree, from the US perspective at the moment, what, what's happening with the frail and elderly in, in these situations? We don't have frailty units, <laughs> that's for sure. In most places, the idea of that and concept is fantastic and I think could really change the way. I mean, we have changed the triage situation in uh, some of our A&Es, but um, uh, discharging home is definitely the best thing for for patients and getting them in and out of the hospital and you know in a quick way and and taken care of. I think we have totally changed the way we send patients home if they do have a stay in the hospital from instead of going to rehab they're able to be discharged home so that's great. So Jugdeep you have a fellowship here that's becoming increasingly well known. Uh, at the moment I believe it's predominantly done by people who've come from a geriatric training pathway but it's been opened up to other people including anesthetists. Um, That's right, Monty. So we've been running that probably for, I think, about six years now. And we've gradually built the fellowship up such that we now have three and a half to four posts per year. And it's been interesting. That's been advertised, like you say, to geriatricians, to anaesthetists, to general medicine physicians as well. But so far, all of our applicants have all been from geriatric medicine. So if I was a young doctor now, knowing what I now know about the future of medicine, about the baby boomers coming through, through how exciting it is. I mean, I chose to do critical care medicine because it allowed me to spread my wings a little bit out from the operating room, which I love being in there, but also that being a bit more of a bedside doctor, etc., etc. I think it'd be a fantastic thing to do. And the first people who get into it are really going to be leaders, world leaders in this. I'm surprised that no one's, that your, your inbox isn't full of glowing CVs at the moment. Um, so we do have glowing CVs, but they tend to be from Jerry and Richards. <laughs> Just before they all get upset. (laughs) Um, But we don't have that many glowing CVs from anaesthetists or kind of people coming through that kind of stream. And I think maybe that's partly because people 
don't really understand what geriatric medicine is. And certainly now that we've set up the FY program, a lot of those junior doctors go, oh, I didn't realize that this is what geriatric medicine is all about. I thought it was all just about rehabilitation and social care. So I think it's a little bit of that, that we haven't been very good as a specialty at advertising exactly what we do and how exciting it is around delivering ger- general medicine, geriatric medicine, rehab, and all of those things all rolled together into this very interesting post. So I think that's one reason. The other reason is I think of course perioperative medicine has really only started appearing out there as a new exciting specialty over the last five years or so and so I think there's going to be a bit of a time lag to anaesthetists kind of recognizing that there are other ways to get the training that they require other than following the traditional anaesthetic training route. I think another reason might be that people are concerned they may not have the skills around management of long-term conditions, knowing how to deal with hypertension, heart failure, Parkinson's disease. They may feel that they can assess those conditions, but they're not equipped to be able to manage those conditions. And that's a challenge to us, isn't it, as to how we start to kind of, you know, broaden that skill set at a more junior level. I think people get put off by doing acute medicine beyond day two or day three after a surgical procedure. You know, people aren't so excited about managing the geriatric syndromes that occur day three onwards, the delirium, the functional decline, that interface of multimorbidity and all of those kinds of issues. So, you know, I think there are probably lots of reasons as to why we've not had as many people from other specialties applying for the posts. But hopefully through these kinds of conversations and the colleges working more closely together, we'll start to see much more cross specialty training starting to happen in the future. I mean, if we look at at the provision of anaesthesia for complex major surgery, if we look at surgical intensive care, if we look at general critical care, adult critical care, it feels as though the majority of our patients are geriatric and the more complex patients are those with geriatric issues. I, I sometimes wonder why and if soon we will have the equivalent of POPs for critical care. You know, that initial day one evaluation of needs and how are we going to get this individual home, etc. So, you know, am am I right in thinking most of the patients that we're actually dealing with, even though we, we may say, oh, I don't want to do acute medicine for geriatric patients. That's what we're doing. I think you're right. And I think, you know, of course, we need to wake up to the fact that patients, um, it's certainly in secondary care and, you know, in primary care, tend the the highest users of health care are the older population. Um, and, you know, we haven't caught up with that on a number of fronts. I think, firstly, undergraduate medicine hasn't caught up with that. You know, certainly locally, we only provide three weeks of geriatric medicine training at an undergraduate level. Now, if you're... If, of patients in a hospital are going to be older, then people need to understand that population better. So I think we do need to kind of lobby at the undergraduate level that to get a fit for purpose workforce, they need to be trained in geriatric medicine. And when we talk about geriatric medicine, I know we've had this conversation before, you know, it's not about it being an age based kind of cutoff. It's about it being a, a biological state. And so, you know, patients with multimorbidity at the age of 50 are going to be the same as some of our kind of more fit older patients Um, not the same but they're going to have the the levels of complexity that we see in the older population as well I think you know we do need to think about undergraduate training I think what is exciting certainly on the physician side of things is that we are changing postgraduate training so There's been a new system which is coming into place in September where anybody going into a medical specialty, pretty much any medical specialty, will need to do an extra year of general medicine. And of course, that will end up being predominantly older people. So hopefully they'll start to get some generic skills through that kind of training. So 
yes, you're right, you know, we haven't woken up to the population that we're actually dealing with. And we won't have enough geriatricians to be providing specialist care for all of these patients in all of these different settings. We have POPs in surgery, but increasingly cardiologists are asking for our support, oncology are asking for it. So, you know, it's an issue across specialties. We're going to wrap up today. Thank you, Jodeep, for so much for joining us. Top Bit Talk. Nick Harrison here. Thanks for listening to Top Med Talk. Now, before we let you go, it's important that we remind you to subscribe to Top Med Talk. That way you'll never, ever miss another episode. Also, if we could encourage you to join us on social media, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, pretty much every single social media platform, we're there. Join us. And finally, check out Top Med Talk. Dot com. If you go to our website, you can subscribe to email updates. That way we can always tell you where we're going to be, what we're going to be doing and how you can join us. Topmedtalk.com and click on the section marked email updates. Finally, Top Med Talk is proud to act as the broadcasting arm of EBPOM, evidence-based perioperative medicine. We'd love you to find out more about them as well. EBPOM.org is their website. That's E-B-P-O-M.org. And if you go to EBPOM.org forward slash meetings, you can find out about some of the wonderful meetings that we attend and cover across the year here on Top Med Talk. That's EBPOM.org forward slash meetings.